Our news is brought to you by Alive. Believe in best. Tonight on Our News, casting ballots. 100 NIB workers take a strike vote today. We've got the latest. Plus two overnight murders hours apart under active investigation. And heartbroken, how a coach allegedly sidelined a Bahamian athlete over her weight. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Christina Dragovich. Topic news tonight, an overwhelming majority of national insurance workers have agreed to strike. The word coming moments ago from the Public Managers Union president. Our Sasha Lightborn spoke with the union chief earlier today and has this report. Negotiations, there are a number of tools available um, to the union and um, we are at an impasse and this is one of the tools that um, the members have advised that we take. For weeks, members of the Public Managers Union at the National Insurance Board have called on NIB executives to properly compensate them for work done during the height of the pandemic and during Hurricane Dorian back in 2019. 134 members voted here in New Providence at the BCPOU Hall, while 21 voted across the family islands. PMU President Frida Cassandra Lewis tells our news members simply want their industrial agreement resolved and signed so they can move on. When we thought that we were at the end, um, there was a change in um, the board's position as it relates um, to the negotiations that have had taken place. If the members agree um, from this pool to the strike, strike vote, then it's a um, tool that we have in our hand to use to assist us in the negotiation phase. Lewis says claims by the board that there is no money have left her baffled. As she says, additional executive hires have created a, quote, Gussie May board, end quote. Now union members are tired of waiting. Persons would have come to work, spend many hours, and during COVID, go back home to their families, Okay, while we would have had executives saying to staff, you have to come to work. But many of the executives were protected in their, the comfort of their homes, working from home. The staff did what needed to be done to ensure the Bahamian public got the services that they need. Voting ended at 4 p.m. For our news, I'm Sasha Lightborn. Meanwhile, senators debating and passing a compendium of financial services bills today that Attorney General Ryan Pinder says will bring the Bahamas even closer to meeting its international obligations. They included a bill for an act to amend the Proceeds of Crime Act, a bill for an act to amend the Anti-Terrorism Act, and a bill for an act to amend the Register of Beneficial Ownership Act 2018. These amendments, Madam President, are required to provide for the continued modernization of our international regulatory obligations, including providing adequate penalty provisions to be a deterrent to violations of the law and to make certain required amendments to remain compliant with international best practices and treaties and international commitments to the Baham that of which the Bahamas is a party. All of the underlying pieces of legislation were passed to ensure compliance with the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing obligations of the Financial Action Task Force. Pinder says amendments to the Anti-Terrorism Act 2018 empower the Financial Intelligence Unit to impose an administrative penalty on any financial institution who contravenes the act, while the amendments to the Proceeds of Crime Act 2018 allows for better alignment of local legislation with international anti-money laundering standards. The Register of Beneficial Ownership Amendments provide for an, an administrative penalty regime by bolstering enforcement tools to deter non-compliance. The compendium of bills got no pushback from the opposition. Leader of Opposition Business, Senator Darren Henfield. We support this compendium of bills. We understand uh, the need for them. The Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Legal Affairs hosting a terrorist financing risk assessment training session for nonprofit organizations that have been deemed high risk. Megan Shepard tells us more. 
Of the 1,047 nonprofit organizations in the country, some are high risk for terrorist financing and money laundering. Attorney General Ryan Pinder explains how large nonprofit organizations that receive cross border donations are high risk for money laundering. It's very important that, from a money laundering point of view, the Bahamas achieves excellence in all ratings. Uh, like I mentioned in, in, in the speech earlier, it affects every Bahamian because we need to be regarded as a low-risk jurisdiction. All of this boils down to risk. And if we're non-compliant in certain sectors, the banking institutions would deem us, and even, even the European Union and other multilateral institutions, as a higher-risk jurisdiction. And that affects all of our day-to-day -day banking. As I mentioned, you know, it takes 30, 60 days to open a bank account in the Bahamas. In Europe, it takes 30 to 60 minutes. The Bahamas is viewed differently from other jurisdictions, and Pinder explains why. Rightfully or wrongly, we are viewed differently from a rate risk point of view. Our goal is to achieve excellence, to achieve compliance in all recommendations of the Financial Action Task Force on money laundering matters. So there is no basis for anybody to view the Bahamas as a high-risk jurisdiction. No. And as to what is required of the nonprofit organizations to be in accordance with best practices, Pinder says this. Those who are receiving um, material contributions, cross-border transactions, those are who I deem more susceptible um, to money laundering, will have to do um, effect effectively know your client or KYC due diligence on those who are donating them money. So if, if they receive a substantial donation, they're going to have to know who that person is, and they're going to have to know the due diligence on that person, very similar to what the banking institutions are doing. They have to comply with that because ultimately the goal is to identify where the money is coming from and who the money is coming from. And, and by and large, our not-for-profits in the Bahamas are really a low-risk category. But we just have to demonstrate to the authorities that we are approaching it in a, in a compliant uh, and a proper way in the regulation of those. Reporting for Our News, I'm Megan Shepard. Their deaths raising more questions than answers back in June 2019. Two Bahamians, Al Ray Ramsey and Blair John, were discovered lifeless on June 4th and June 5th in the Po River in Turin, Italy. Italian police concluding the deaths were accidental by drowning. However, many Bahamians still questioned those reports. Minister of Foreign Affairs Fred Mitchell telling reporters in October 2021 he visited Italy and inquired about receiving the files related to this case. The previous government had also hired a private lawyer to coordinate that approach uh, to the Italian government. We were told uh, at, during that visit that within two weeks we would get the file. We've been trying to get the file, still can't get the file, and we're still working to get the file. And every time I have the opportunity to meet them, I keep saying that we don't have the file and we need the file for our own experts to have a look at it. As to whether or not the Davis administration intends to reopen the investigations, Minister Mitchell had this response. Well, what we thought is that we needed to have our own people look at the file to be sure that we were satisfied that all has been done to deal with it. And the question is, we're stepping quite gingerly because, you know, when you open these things up, family members, uh, it's a real sensitive thing, but people want closure. Uh, and uh, so we had made a pledge in opposition that we would uh, do all we can to get to a proper answer on this. And uh, so that's what we're seeking to do. Meanwhile, two men are dead following two separate shootings Tuesday night. Police press liaison officer Superintendent Audley Peters spoke to media at the scene of the second shooting around midnight on Sutton Street off Camp Road. We met a male lying just outside his front door, suffering from gunshot wounds. The emergency medical services visited the scene and later pronounced the male lifeless. Peters says details on that shooting are still sketchy. This says police are still investigating a shooting at Cynthia Mother Pratt Park on 2nd Street and Poinciana Avenue, where a man was shot and killed. Emil was seated watching a basketball game when a lone gunman walked up to him and discharged the weapon, fatally wounding him. We appeal to members of both communities who may have any information to contact your various area commanders. Well, temperatures still in the mid 80s this evening. Meteorologist Greg Thompson is in the Weather Center with the details. Good evening, Greg.
Thanks, Christina. Welcome, everybody, for our first look at weather. Blue skies around the islands today and allow temperatures to warm up. We are in the low 80s, settling right now. Clear skies outside our studios right now. Good night to get outdoors and enjoy. South southeast winds at 30 miles per hour, still a bit of a breeze, but those temperatures are very warm, 84 degrees. Satellite view, quiet around the islands. Once again, high pressure remains in charge at highest, slowly sal sliding out towards the east, but it kept us very, very warm today. And those winds continuing to whip up out there, but those temperatures will continue to stay warm tonight through tomorrow. That's your first look at weather. Your extended forecast is still to come. Still to come on our news, the heartbreaking story of a Bahamian athlete over claims of weight shaming. Plus, diplomatic mission, meet the country's newest ambassadors and council generals. Plus, NBA season enters its final week of play. How DeAndre Ayton is helping the Sun secure a win over the Lakers. The details when our news returns. A youth tennis player is telling her story after she says she was criticized for her weight by her coach during a recent national team trip to El Salvador. Jared Higgs sat down with her and has this report. 14-year-old Rachel Thompson started playing tennis when she was seven years old. I have two worlds, my personal world and my tennis world. But those worlds came crashing down after a recent national team trip to El Salvador, where Rachel played under a new coach. She felt that I did not deserve to be there, even though I earned my spot there. The 14-year-old, who was 13 during the trip last month, was discouraged after she says her coach seemed to judge her on her plus-size appearance and not on her playing ability. Rachel was selected based on rankings by the BLTA, but she says comments were made about her weight. Every day, she constantly made remarks about my weight, and she was insinuating things about my size, and she would make comments, and she, like she, like she would make it seem like she didn't say it, and like one day, like the first day I heard it, which is like the first day of the tournament, I heard her say it under her breath. With her parents by her side, Rachel, who has ambitions to play professionally, says the coach picked players for their matches who she perceived to be their strongest players. Even when the Bahamas was guaranteed not to be able to advance in the tournament, the coach still did not select Rachel to play, she says. That, coupled with the alleged comments about her weight, left Rachel confused about whether she was playing the right sport. I was like, we order food more than we cook when we go away because we're in a hotel. And she whispered in her breath, I can see that. The treatment on that trip left Rachel discouraged and she didn't want to go back to practice. After finally confiding in her parents, she got back on the court. I thought that that sport wasn't for me and that I didn't really belong in the sport because that's how she made me feel. But as my, but as like I had support here in Nassau and in Freeport and my, my parents talked to me and they brought my spirits back up and I slowly started I started playing again. Our news reached out to BLTA President Perry Newton Jr. as well as the coach for response. The coach directed us to the BLTA saying she didn't wish to respond. Newton did respond to our news saying the matter was under investigation by the BLTA. In a phone interview, Newton described the allegations as out of character for the coach selected. We're still um, looking into it and, uh, and uh, you know, to be honest, we just want to uh, be able to support our players as best as possible. Um, we, we, we want our players to strive. Uh, we want our players to be encouraged uh, because, uh, you know, it, nobody can stop a dream. Meanwhile, Rachel, a Grand Bahama resident, has bounced back and is in New Providence for the Spring Classic this weekend. She says support from her school, fellow tennis players, coaches and parents has been phenomenal. She also has a new phrase to live by. Six and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's my new mantra. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. Thanks, Jared. What an inspiring story. 
Well, a Grand Bahama Boys Club is working to sow seeds of productivity and positivity among young men. Director of the Falcons Boys Club, Pastor Darren Roll, explains the small act of volunteering can have a huge impact on the lives of boys between the ages of 10 and 17. We need more men to step in. For evil to thrive, a few good men must do nothing. Uh, volunteering isn't easy. Uh, the spirit of volunteerism. Uh, I retired in 2020 after teaching for 29 years. I work with children seven days a week. All is not lost with our young men. I believe, we believe that more young men are doing positive things than doing negative things. And that's our job, that's our thrust, to continue to remind the young men of the Lewis Yard Primary School of their significance and the role that they now play and will continue to play in our society. This Friday, the Falcons Boys Club will host its 19th annual Building Youth is Better Than Mending Men Boys Conference, sending the message to the students of Lewis Yard Primary that, quote, you are not insignificant. Rotary Representative Stephen Gunn says supporting the youth can help to build better citizens down the line. If we took more time to work with our youth, we wouldn't have some of the men in our country doing some of the things that they're doing these days, which are not wholesome to each other or to our communities. When our news comes back from the break, seven new diplomats sworn in today meet the new faces in a moment. But first, UB soccer gets its first win. That's coming up when our news returns. This is our news. Welcome back. Six ambassadors and one council general sworn in to serve the country this afternoon. This new cohort of ambassadorial appointments will expand the reach and access to the services of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, particularly as the Bahamas establishes the first Bahamian consulate in Toronto. Here's Megan Shepherd. Minister of Foreign Affairs Fred Mitchell, noting the focus of these ambassadors and council general will be to assist the significant Bahamian population in Canada. Even though Ottawa is where the capital of Canada is, and so that's where the High Commission or the Embassy is, Bahamians are mainly in Toronto, let's start there, which is Canada's largest city. So for some time, Bahamians have been saying uh, Ottawa's too far to go to. Uh, certainly if you're in Halifax, it's too far to go to, uh, too difficult to get to if they need consular issues addressed. So the thinking is to put a consulate in Toronto, which will be able to deal with the concerns and issues connected with the Bahamian community in Toronto. The newest ambassadors include Her Excellency C.V. Hope Strawn, His Excellency Winston Pinnock, His Excellency Leon Williams, His Excellency Damien Gomez, His Excellency Jamal Roll, and His Excellency Ron Pinder. Al Dillett was sworn in as Council General. Speaking on behalf of the cohort, he pledged to promote Bahamian interests in the international affairs of states. On behalf of myself and the other in our group of envoys, I will say that it is our intention, and please pass this on to the Prime Minister, to do our level best to represent the country and to continue the contributions in the international affairs of state as best we can. Mitchell says the Foreign Services Institute was established last year with the goal of shaping future foreign services workers. Everybody's got to run through that course. We are in the process of negotiating a memorandum of understanding with the University of the Bahamas. So it becomes a certificate which will ultimately issue, be issued by the university and people will be able to carry it forth wherever they go. So you come to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with a basic education but you get certified as a foreign service officer by running through this course. So that's the idea, similar to the teacher certificate. Reporting for Our News, I'm Megan Shepard.
Prime Minister Philip Davis is expected to deliver the keynote address at the University of the Bahamas North Campus third biennial Sustainable Grand Bahama Conference. UB North President Dr. Ian Strawn says the conference will focus on diversifying and expanding our economy. The focus, therefore, of the third biannual Sustainable Grand Bahama Conference will be to explore diversification and adaptation as mechanisms to secure a sustainable future for present and future generations. We are truly grateful that this year's conference has attracted so many excellent industry leaders, scientists, scholars, and policy makers. This is just the type of exchange we hoped to achieve. The conference is scheduled for Thursday through Saturday and will be held virtually. To register for the conference, visit sustainablegb.org. Dr. Strawn explains that work and presentations held from the past two conferences and the upcoming one will be disseminated to the public. We will be creating an anthology of the best presentations from this and the previous two conferences. It is important that we continue to make knowledge, make the knowledge we create available to as many as possible. And the publication, this publication is another means of doing this. Well, DeAndre Ayton helping the Suns to win over the Lakers as the NBA season enters its final week of play. Plus, UB Soccer gets its first win. Here's Marcellus Hall. Thanks a lot, Christina, and welcome to Our Sports, everybody. I'm Marcellus Hall. The Phoenix Suns have had a fantastic season. As it winds down now, they continue to hold on to first place in the entire NBA, much less the Western Conference. Last night, taking on the LA Lakers, trying to end their season for all intents and purposes as far as playoffs were concerned. Lakers needed a win. Phoenix had different ideas. Let's take a look. DeAndre Ayton and the Phoenix Suns hosting the LA Lakers. Suns looking to build on their best record in the league with a victory. And that's exactly what they would do. 121 to 110 ends up being the final score. Lakers eliminated from playoff contention with the loss. Suns, meanwhile, improved to 63 and 16 tops in the league. Taking a look at DeAndre Ayton's stats, uh, he played pretty well. Just 26 minutes on the floor, had 22 points, 13 rebounds, 2 assists, and a block. Suns now winding down the regular season. Playoffs just around the corner. Next game for them will be against the Clippers. That comes your way tonight. That game will be played in Los Angeles. Taking a look at Buddy Heald and the Indiana Pacers. They played last night as well. Pacers taking on the Philadelphia 76ers and Indiana uh, getting another loss. Uh, they get the loss here 131 to 122 as 76ers get the win. Taking a look at Buddy's stats. Uh, he played all right again in a losing out for 38 minutes played. Finished up with 25 points, 11 rebounds, 5 assists, a steal, and a blocks as he uh, racked up the stat sheet. But again, it would come in a losing effort. If you're wondering when the Pacers play again, uh, their next game will come your way this week as well. Uh, the next game will come your way when they take on the very same Philadelphia 76ers, this time in Philadelphia. we got some other news coming in for you this time from, from the University of the Bahamas as uh, they continue to do some things with their soccer program. Here's how it went down yesterday. They played a scrimmage. UB has been playing a series of scrimmages uh, as a side gets ready for eventual return to play locally. They played a third scrimmage on Sunday against the United FC. At C.H. Reeves, Mingos had lost their first two matches and were looking to change things around. They scored the first half, but it would be United responding. They go on to get the win here. 2-1, uh, the Mingos do. Head coach Dion Gadet said, glad the team was able to gain some confidence in their ability. And that's your look at sports here on this Hump Day Wednesday. I'm Marcellus Hall. Back to you, Christina. Thanks, Marcellus. Ahead on our news, Greg is back with the extended weather forecast. Stay with us. Welcome back to our news. 
Humid conditions move into the area. Greg is back in the Weather Center with a look ahead. Thanks again, Christina, and welcome back, everybody, for our second look at weather. Blue skies, warm temperatures around the islands today, cloudless skies, if you want to call it that. Those high temperatures getting up into the mid to upper 80s, even with the breeze, it's still a bit breezy out there. Temperatures still felt very warm. We're approaching those summer-like temperatures as the month winds up. Frontal boundary to the north will continue to exit towards the uh, east. That high pressure will keep that at bay, but we expect a low pressure system to develop across the Georgia, Alabama area by tomorrow. And that will usher in or at least drag a frontal boundary across our area sometime on Friday. So some isolated showers and thunderstorms expected with that system once it gets in here. But we do expect some very nice weather for the weekend as some milder temperatures is expected by then. Boating forecast for the Northwest Bahamas tonight through tomorrow. Small craft caution in effect. South to southwesterly winds at 15 to 20 knots. Those winds will gust higher at times. Very rough seas, four to seven feet over the ocean. Tide will be high at 12.35 in the morning. For the southeast and central Bahamas, southeast to southerly flow at 15 knots expected. Your seas will be running three to five feet over open waters. Here's a look now at your national forecast. A look now at your extended forecast through next Wednesday. Frontal boundary expected to get in here by Friday. We could see some isolated showers early Saturday, and then things will improve for the balance of the weekend. That's your look at weather. Back to you, Christina. Thanks, Greg, and thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Christina Dragovich. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Have a beautiful evening, Bahamas.